Hello, and welcome to another Digital Differential Equations lecture video for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we are going to be going through chapter 4.6 and discussing forced oscillations. In chapter 4.6, we look specifically at forced vibrations of a harmonic oscillator. This leads to an introduction to phenomena such as beats, resonance, and stability. There are a few great YouTube video demonstrations in our Canvas course in Module 4.6 that will illustrate these phenomena that you should absolutely see before progressing through this set of guided lecture notes. So maybe now is a good time to pause these videos and go look at the ones I've attached in our Canvas Module 4.6. At this point, we have developed techniques to solve DEs for mass spring systems with a variety of common forcing functions. However, complications can arise with sinusoidal forcing functions and are particularly important in many applications beyond spring mass systems and RLC circuits. Consider the IVP given here, where a trigonometric forcing function is given, and the initial conditions x of 0 is x0, x dot of 0 is v0. If the roots of the characteristic equation for the corresponding homogeneous DE are complex, then the homogeneous solution will be of the form e to the alpha t times c1 cosine omega naught t plus c2 sine omega naught t. Here, we consider the relationship between the natural frequency omega naught of the spring mass system and the frequency of the forcing function omega f. There are two important scenarios to consider. When omega naught is near omega f and when omega naught is equal to omega f. The first scenario. When omega naught is near omega f, we will see the presence of beats that is caused by the interaction of these two frequencies. Sometimes we will see that the two frequencies will add to each other, increasing your amplitudes. And sometimes the two frequencies will cancel each other out reducing the amplitude of the oscillations. The second scenario is when omega naught equals omega f. In this scenario, your frequencies will combine to create what is called resonance. And resonance is displayed when the amplitude of your oscillations increase. consistently, getting larger and larger. Let's look at an example. Consider the initial value problem, x double dot plus 64x equals 2 cosine 7t. And let's first start by looking at our homogeneous solution. Our typical method would be to write your characteristic polynomial.
by replacing the derivative terms with r. So don't put an r on the 64 term. Notice that this equation can be solved by writing the 64 on the right hand side of the equation and then taking a square root. which gives two solutions plus or minus 8i. I think from here we want to recognize that our real part of our solution is 0, and the imaginary part of our solution is the 8. Now recall when we have a purely complex solution to our characteristic equation, that our homogeneous solution, xh, will be of the form e to the alpha t, c1 cosine beta t, plus c2 sine beta t. Now for us, since our real part alpha is 0, e to the alpha t turns into just 1. So our homogeneous solution will look like c1 cosine 8t plus c2 sine 8t. And this is our homogeneous solution. At this point, it's worth noting that our natural frequency is not the same as our for forcing frequency, but they are close. Now, I'm not defining what close is, but we will consider the idea of close a little bit later. Now let's consider our non-homogeneous solution. Now because our forcing function is trigonometric, I'm going to use the method of undetermined coefficients. And so remember for the method of undetermined coefficients, we will guess a form for xp. Where our guess has the undetermined coefficients a but the, for, or the forcing frequency is still going to be the 7. And remember, our guess has to include both a cosine and a sine term. And we're going to need our derivatives. So let's find xp prime, which will be negative 7a sine 7t plus 7b cosine 7t. And our second derivative will be negative 49a cosine 7t minus 49b sine 17. And I would like to use these now 
in our original differential equation, and we'll determine now what A and B has to be for this particular DE. So we'll have our x double dot plus 64x, so plus 64x double dot of p, 64xp will have to equal 2 cosine of 7t for the appropriate choices of a and b. So here ours is going to be plus 64 times our original guess. And this has to equal to 2 cosine 70. So now let's look at combining similar terms. So if we combined the cosine expressions, then I think we'll have 15a cosine 70. And if we combine our sine expressions, We'll have plus 15b sine of 7t, and this still has to equal our 2 cosine 7t. Now comparing coefficients, we know the coefficient of our cosine has to match the coefficient of our cosine term on the right hand side, which tells us 15a has to equal 2. Similarly, the coefficient of the sine term has to match the coefficient of the sine term on the right hand side. And since there is no sine term, we can safely say the coefficient is zero. So this tells us 15b has to equal zero. Solving these for a and b tells us a has to be 2 fifteenths, b has to be zero. This gives us our particular solution as 2 fifteenths cosine of 70. Now, if we take our particular solution and add it to our homogeneous solution, we'll get our general solution. So now recall that our general solution by the non-homogeneous principle will be x of t. It's going to be our homogeneous solution, c1 cosine 8t plus c2 sine of 8t plus our particular solution that we found. Two fifteenths cosine of seventy. 
Now this is our general solution. Let us now go find the solution to our IVP, which means we're going to need to find our first derivative. Don't forget to use the chain rule when taking your derivatives. And we'll evaluate both of these at zero. So our initial conditions. When you evaluate your position function at zero, and remember when you evaluate cosine at zero, cosine of zero is one, and sine of zero is zero. So we'll get C1 plus, again, cosine of zero ends up being one, so plus two fifteenths, and from our initial conditions, we know this has to be zero. Similarly, when we evaluate our first derivative as zero, sine of zero is going to be zero, cosine of zero is going to be one, sine of zero is going to be zero. So we'll get 8c2, and from our initial conditions, this has to be zero still. This tells us that C1 has to be negative 2 fifteenths and C2 has to be 0, which allows us to write the solution to our IVP as x of t is negative 2 fifteenths cosine of 8t plus 2 fifteenths cosine of 7t. And notice the mechanics, the methods we're using to solve this differential equation does not differ from the methods we used in chapter 4.4. The difference is I would like to now illustrate what does this solution to this IVP look like when the natural frequency is so close to your forcing frequency. So let's consider what a sketch of this will look like. And to help us create this sketch, I'd like to use Desmos. So let's go ahead and turn on Desmos now. And let's enter our solution. So go ahead and enter into your equation menu. Now our solution is in terms of the variable x, but I'm going to write it in decimals as our standard y equals. So we had negative 2 fifteenths cosine of 8t plus 2 fifteenths cosine of 70. Now right now the scale on our graph on the y-axis is not allowing us to see the beats very nicely. So I'm going to click on the wrench icon and change our y-axis to go from 
negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. I'm going to scroll over to the side. So now what you can see is the presence of the beats in our solution. Now what I wanted to illustrate when I mentioned earlier is what exactly do we mean by close? Right now, 7, our forcing frequency, is kind of close to 8. It's a distance of 1. But what happens as we change this value? And the easiest way to show this is if I were to go back into Desmos. And let's change the 7 to a, sl a, a variable P. And I'm going to allow P to be a slider. Now what that means is I can change the value of P on this sliding bar. And I'll put it back to 7 where it was. Notice as we're far from 8, our natural frequency, the beats aren't very apparent. But as we get closer and closer, the bearings of beats is more easy to see. Now this is where we were at, at 7. But if I allow this forcing frequency to get closer to 8, you'll see how the beats will change in period. And so the closer we are, the longer period we see in those beats. Again, if we get go back towards 7, then the period for those beats gets shorter and shorter. So for our solution that we're talking about, let's go ahead and add a graphic to help us with this. And when I form this, or when I create this graphic, I usually find it easier if I put in some construction lines. So for our construction lines, let's start at the origin. Now these construction lines are not actually part of our solution. This is just how I'm able to duplicate what we see in Desmos. Consider these to be the envelope that the solutions will fit inside of. So now our solutions will form these beats, these increasing amplitude oscillations. And I'm trying my best to duplicate what we saw in Desmos. Oops. You're probably going to be able to do much better on a piece of paper than I'm able to do in my tablet right now. Oops. But what you'd like to see is the presence of beats in our solution. Now, if you're interested in more information on the presence of beats, I would definitely encourage you to look at our textbook. They do a much more complete and thorough analysis of these beats and what you should expect to see with them. Let's try another example. Let's find the solution to this IDP. And again, let's start with our homogeneous solution. So remember with your homogeneous solution, we force the right-hand side to equal zero. And we'll write our characteristic equation 
Remember, only replace the derivative terms with r's. So this last term just stays a 1. So notice that we can move the 1 to the other side and take a square root. This gives us two solutions to our characteristic equation, plus or minus i. Where we identify the real part, alpha, of our characteristic solution is zero, and the imaginary part, beta, is just one. So recall now, when we have complex solutions to our characteristic equation, that our homogeneous solution will be of the form e to the alpha t, c1 cosine beta t, plus c2 sine beta t. Now here, since our real portion alpha is zero, the e to the alpha t is just one. And so that our homogeneous solution becomes c1 cosine a beta t, or just t, plus c2 sine beta t, or just t. And this is our homogeneous solution. Now at this point it's worth noting that the natural frequency, omega naught, your natural frequency, is the same as the forcing frequency. This tells us that we should expect to see resonance in our solutions. But let's continue so we can see what resonance looks like. And we'll continue by looking for our non-homogeneous solution. Now again, I'm going to use the method of undetermined coefficients because our forcing function is trigonometric. So it tells us we guess the form of xp has to be, now remember, when your forcing function is a duplication of one of your homogeneous solutions, we have to include that extra factor of t. So it tells us our forcing function, or our particular solution, has to look like a t cosine t plus b t sine t. And we're going to need to find our derivatives still, so let's go find xp prime and xp double prime. So with our derivatives, make sure we identify that we have a product of two functions, and so don't forget the product rule. So the derivative of the first, a t is just a times your second cosine of t, plus the derivative of your second, which is going to be negative, sine times your first, which was the a t, plus the derivative of b t sine t. Again, product rule says the derivative of the first is just b times your second. Plus, by the product rule, the derivative of sine of t is cosine of t times your first, which I like writing that in front. And now we'll find our second derivative. So the derivative of a cosine of t is negative a sine of t. And now, again, with this 
second term. This is a product, so product rule. The derivative of AT is minus A times the second regular. Plus by the product rule, the derivative of sine is going to be cosine of t times the first, which I like writing that in front. Move on to the next one. The derivative of b sine t is going to be b cosine of t. And the derivative of bt cosine t, again, don't forget to use the product rule, is going to be plus b times the cosine of t. And the derivative of cosine would be negative sine times the first, which I like writing that in front. Now if I recollect like terms here, I think we can write xp double prime as, let's see which terms we can combine together. So it looks like we can combine these two sine terms together. So we'll have negative 2a sine of t minus a t cosine of t. And it also looks like we can combine these two cosine terms together. So plus 2b cosine of t minus b t sine of t. So now let's look back at our original equation. We wanted to find the particular solution to our IVP. So let's substitute these into that IVP. So I'm going to write it here just for clarity for us. So we had x double dot plus x equals 2 cosine of t. So let's replace x double dot with what we found, which was negative 2a sine of t minus a t cosine of t plus 2b cosine of t minus b t sine t. Add this to our original guess for what x of t was. So xp was a t cosine of t plus b t sine t. And this all had to equal 2 cosine of t. Now what I'd like to do is to continue to simplify this. And again, let's do that by adding like terms. What you want to notice is that this negative a t cosine of t will cancel with this a t cosine of t. Similarly, this b t sine t will cancel with this b t sine t, because one is negative, one is positive. So those will cancel. This leaves us with just negative 2a sine of t plus 2b cosine of t has to equal to 2 cosine of t on the right hand side.
So again, by comparing coefficients, we know that the coefficient of the cosine term has to match the coefficient of the cosine term on the right-hand side. So this tells us that 2b has to equal 2 and negative 2a, the coefficient of the sine term on the left-hand side, has to match the coefficient of the sine term on the right side. And since there is no coefficient, there is no sine, we know this has to be 0. So this tells us a has to be 0 and b has to be 1. This allows us to write the particular solution, xp, as, now if we, if we let a equals 0 and b equal 1, then we just get t sine of t. This is the particular solution that we were looking for. Now from here, this allows us to write again our general solution using the non-homogeneous principle, x of t, as the sum of our homogeneous solution. So c1 cosine t, c2 sine t, plus the particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation t sine t. Okay, now we'll continue to find the solution to our initial value problem. So we're going to have to find our constant c1 and c2 for the given initial conditions. So we'll proceed by finding our first derivative. So the derivative of c1 cosine t is going to be negative c1 sine t plus c2 cosine t. And don't forget, when you're looking at this last term, that this is a product, so make sure we use the product rule. The derivative of t sine t is going to be sine t, this is sine t, plus derivative of sine t is cosine t, so it will be t cosine of t. Now for our initial conditions, we know x of 0 and x dot of 0. So remember, when we plug in 0 into our original solution, cosine of 0 is going to be 1, sine of 0 is going to be 0, and this is all going to be 0 as well. So we just get c1. And from our initial conditions, we know this was 1. For our derivative, again, sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0, and this is 0 times 1, so this is also 0. So I think we just get c2, and from our initial conditions, we know this is 0. This allows us to write now the solution to our IVP as cosine of t, oh, I forgot the x, x of t is cosine of t plus t sine t. This is the solution to our IVP. And again, recall the mechanics, the method I'm using is nothing different than what we already did in chapter 4.4. But what we'd like to see is that this solution is going to give us the phenomena we call resonance. Now to see the resonance, again, let's look at what a graph of this solution will look like. And I want to do the graph in Desmos, but let's put a coordinate system here for our notes for completeness. So let's go turn on Desmos again. So 
So our solution was, I'm going to write it in terms of y again. y equals cosine of t plus t sine of t. Now, the, 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 the scale on my axis doesn't show the resonance yet. So let's see if we can zoom out. looks like this resonance happens so quickly that, is, that our amplitude increases so fast I can't see it. So let me see if I can adjust our viewing window by choosing the wrench icon. And I'm going to change the x-axis so it starts at 0. And let's maybe just go up to 20 for a moment. This is kind of an exploration to see what works good for you. Now if I try and zoom out from here, you can see how the amplitude increases so quickly. That the amplitude of our oscillations is increasing very quickly. And this is what we, what we call resonance. So let me go back to our notes and let's put a, put a graph here for completeness. Again, it's a little hard for me to draw this on my tablet. I'm going to stop there. But what you'd like to see is from this, we have now seen resonance. Now, the presence of resonance is incre incredibly destructive. And again, so I want to encourage you now to make sure you watch the resource videos that I've included on our. Uh, module 4.6 page to see several real-life examples of what resonance is going to look like. Now I'd like to stop this video here since we're at about 42 minutes and I'm going to make a second video to do a couple more examples that are shown in our guided notes. I hope these examples are helpful and I'll see you next time.